How far can a man fall to earth? Rolf Ulrich Kaiser fell from the heavens into the cosmos. A once core personality of the German Kosmischer Musik, Kaiser's career had a Teutonic quality to it, the Mad Monk as he was called. Kaiser was entangled in the peak of Krautrock, as it was then called, from 1968-1969 to 1974. The term rise and fall is overused to abuse today, but Kaiser's had a certain poetic down going to it. The abbreviation R.U.K. is mired now in controversies and credit for his business role in 1970s Germany. There were five years where it seemed Kaiser was the avant-garde German music industry. Some say his labels and tastes were its peak, others say his odd personality was his labels downfall. By 1976, Kaiser's name had been expunged, he had cloistered himself off in an isolated world of psychedelics and impossible goals. Was Kaiser the victim or the perpetrator? Was it business? Was it money? Was it contracts? Was it drugs? Was it woman? Or was it Kaiser? It had only taken five or so years for Kaiser's bargain to come due. Was this a madman or a businessman? Kaiser, and partner Peter Meisel's music label, Or Music, was involved with nearly every major band of the period. Tangerine Dream, Amandul, Popol Vuh, Guru Guru, and the countless other personalities who dominated the culture of kraut rock, as it was called in foreign countries. Kaiser exported it as his culture. Kaiser started as a literati literature major turned cutthroat music journalist turned polarizing producer. R.U.K. was known to microdose his coffee to sustain his marathon 8-hour writing sessions and midnight business calls. Kaiser promoted this cosmic music, or pimped it, but was later sued by its icons, born from his own labels. A new left ideologue? A turncoat capitalist? Or something more? As one of the few chroniclers of Kaiser, John Rizzo wrote, There is nearly no risk that Kaiser could suddenly reappear and hit back. Kaiser allowed his reputation to be written by others after he drew away from the spotlight. Time and the mellowing of rumors have somewhat restored Kaiser to history, but his name is a heavy name. That does not mean Kaiser is a simple figure. His personality was literary in some respects. Where is he? Not dead, but gone. Never to return. Rolf Ulrich Kaiser no longer exists. He was obliterated, but not killed by his own personality. For simplicity, R.U.K., or simply Kaiser, will largely be used here in lieu of the full Rolf Ulrich Kaiser. It is not likely Kaiser would have disliked the widespread acronym anyways. The man used dozens of pseudonyms at the same time in different magazines. Fritz Bass was a common pseudonym, for example. As far as anyone knows, Kaiser was born in Buckau on June 18, 1943, raised in Berlin, then went to university in Cologne. He seems to have been a diligent student studying the German language, literature, philosophy, sociology, and dramatic theory. Even early on, Kaiser was an entrepreneur who set his eyes on the music business. His business acumen predated any political interests. Kaiser would import foreign American or British magazines to sell at a high markup in Germany, which was rather isolated from the international music scene at the time. Though, Kaiser claimed he made more money from American porno magazines he was able to import and resell. Kaiser sold these magazines while networking at folk festivals throughout the mid-1960s, beginning in 1964, where he became interested in the business side of the music industry. He used the money and reputation from the magazine sales to attack the German radio and popular or schlanger music of the time as out-of-touch drivel. Kaiser heralded the influence of American rock music on Germany. R.U.K. had a special fondness for the Fugs and Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention. Avant-garde sounds and Zappa's cutting statements on the music industry attracted Kaiser who was a firebrand polemicist. Kaiser's writings were best considered polemics by the late 1960s. Under the influence of the student movements of the era and new left philosophers like Herbert Marcus, Kaiser adjusted his writing to a political slant. 
he became, as he was known in Berlin, the Mad Monk. Kaiser's daily writings were endless. He would apparently awake at 5 o'clock, then binge write without rest for 8 hours. After a rest of some sort or stimulant, he would send off his articles, screeds, and rants to dozens of music magazines across Europe. Every German music publication saw submission by Kaiser at some point. Associates would later recall this is how Kaiser gained his skills in PR and networking. RUK kept a book of thousands of addresses which included everyone from editors to major figures in the European music industry, then to even associates of writer William Burroughs in New York. While becoming more radical in tone, as to not be outpaced by public rhetoric, by 1969-1970, Kaiser's publications maintained his interests. His output included Zap Zap Zappa in 1968, Underground, Pop, No, Counterculture, 1969, Frank Zappa, 1971, a biography of Frank Zappa, and Rockzeit, 1972. All were ostensibly about Frank Zappa and Washington funky 1960s style and music politics. Kaiser's pure, unshackled productivity resulted in his involvement in one of Germany's first major rock music festivals, the International Essen Song Days Festival. A music festival from September 25th to September 29th, 1968, which brought international rock to West Germany. It was a direct shock to the local music culture. Kaiser was able to secure the festival a good amount of money from the city and state. The point was to mix music and politics, but Kaiser's involvement suggested more mercenary intentions. He wanted to get close to major artists, influence German music tastes, and establish himself as a participant rather than observer. Many major names of German music would appear at or on the festival stage. Amandul, One, Tangerine Dream, Guru Guru Groove, and Sol or Zol Caravan. That is alongside the international acts of the time planned to appear, such as the Fugs, Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention, and Alexis Corner. The festival was somewhat hamstrung internationally though. The French musicians slated to appear were prevented from attending by their union, and musicians from the USSR were denied visas due to political tensions. Well, Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention would perform. It is unknown if RUK was able to meet his idol Frank Zappa at it, but Zappa's influence on German music from then on would justify Kaiser's rising position. By 1969, Kaiser had partnered with Berlin music publisher Peter Meisel to found the Ohr music label, or his ear in German. The foundation of Ohr would later spawn secondary labels such as Pills, Mushroom, and Kosmische Musik, Cosmic Music. The enterprise was to create a new German rock. The Ohr label attempted to be a tastemaker for both old-style pop and new-style rock in Germany. It appealed to the German fringe or the experimental. It was mostly Kaiser's tastes because he held the purse strings. Their label crusade was inspired by a menagerie of vaguely new left politics, psychedelics, and the advent of the mechanical synthesizer. Psychoactives and technology were pushing musicians to new frontiers. Kaiser, a fan of grand plans, thought he could separate the fringe from the mainstream and make it its own. When Meisel was saddled with the emergent bands from the Song Days Festival, Kaiser's plans were in motion. It was time for a new music industry. Kaiser's Ore label had a mixture of bands that represented West Germany slash Berlin's cutting edge a pseudo-movement that would grow into cosmic music. Those that Kaiser had been acquainted with earlier from the Essen Song Days Festival, Tangerine Dream, Guru Guru Groove, now renamed Guru Guru, Amandul, then others such as the later legendary Popol Vuh and Ashra Temple. Kaiser's signings reached rather deep, including groups such as the folk group turned rock, Holderlin, the Ashra Temple-influenced band Mythos, and the group Blitzkrieg renamed Wallenstein to be more copacetic to the vibe Kaiser was marketing. How influential was Kaiser's promotion on these bands' later popularity? It's unclear. Kaiser was rather hands-off in producing these bands, but was liberal in signing whatever group he considered to be cool. Kaiser believed he was a tastemaker leading West Germany into a new age from his headquarters in Berlin. All these groups were somewhat influenced by Anglo-American rock and the culture of the time, but RUK would later snidely brag his roster on the label was 
so progressive that Anglo-American bands can't keep up with them. Or in its subdivisions were soon weighed down by Kaiser's overwhelming enthusiasm, as it were. At its peak, War was producing 30 plus acts at one time. This was a relatively independent label with a small staff and essentially no institutional support. The more political elements of Germany's new music scene were soon accusing RUK of being a musical robber baron, exploiting his signees. Kaiser then mounted a defense of the musical marketplace against his critics. The argument boiled over into a 1971 discussion on German TV. Kaiser defended his label's practices, and Nico Pallet, manager of the radical Berlin band Topstina Scherben, argued against Kaiser's capitalistic intentions. It was only half a debate, really. By the height of the argument, Pilot had apparently drew an axe from his jacket, failed at chopping a table in half as intimidation against his opponents, Pallet declared TV an instrument of repression in this mass society, then took the microphones from the studio and declared he was liberating them because I need four people in youth prison, then knocked the broadcast off the air. The anti-capitalist then fled the studio with the microphones. Kaiser had won the arguments against him by essentially default. Due to exterior influences on Kaiser by this point, Ord was setting its goals high by 1971. The term Kozmisch Musik had been coined by Edgar Froza of Tangerine Dream in reference to the developing sounds of the post-human synthesizers, such as in his own work on Tangerine Dream's early albums. Kaiser, though, soon adopted the term Kosmisch Musik, or Cosmic Music in English. Kaiser expanded the term, by his own decision, to his entire stable of artists beyond Tangerine Dream. Derisive of the term Krautrock, as it was coined by foreign press, Kaiser was hoping Orr could market this cosmic music internationally through New York. RUK continued the acquisition of bands to fill international deals with foreign labels, which were questionably profitable. As Johan Ritza writes in Times and Sound, by this point, Orr had sold a quarter of a million records, but yielded only a small profit, if any at that time, although the company was able to land some licensed deals with foreign labels. By 1972, the German music business, both domestically and internationally, had expanded, but the cost of Orr and its sub-labels had also grown. Once he secured an ad in the Rolling Stone in 1973, Kaiser was dedicated to selling cosmic music internationally. Those exterior influences on Kaiser were mainly Gilletman, Kaiser's girlfriend by 1971-1972. Though somewhat obscure, Leitman was either a fashion or textile designer. With artist Peter Geithner, she would soon wield an influence on Orr's overall aesthetics. Album art became more psychedelic, but the line was eventually drawn when the band signed to Orr refused to wear her cosmic outfits or attire. The Kaiser and Lettman herself would soon adopt the fashion, though. The artist Geithner's design philosophies would dominate the label's designs to appeal to cosmic music and cosmic philosophy. It seems, either due to increased use of psychedelics or a crushing business schedule, Kaiser's business senses were dulling by then. Orr's output was increasing, but bands were losing confidence in the management. The turning point would come in 1972, with LSD guru Timothy Leary's arrival in Switzerland, an appearance that would send waves through European culture. Leary's arrival in Switzerland would introduce an undiluted dose, almost literally, of American psychedelic and drug culture to European music. Leary had been able to flee from California to Tangiers, where he claimed he was briefly held hostage by the formerly friendly Black Panthers, then to Switzerland where he was housed by arms dealer Michael Hachard. As Leary was an international name in international circles, Ashrod Temple soon announced a desire to collaborate with Leary and his circle. Due to his book of contacts, Kaiser was able to get Ashrod Temple, and Orr in general, in contact with Leary. Leary happily acquiesced, as well in Switzerland, Leary and his companions had acquired a taste for German music while on psychoactive trips and binges, comparing cosmic music to Pink Floyd, though they also said they were getting rather tired of playing Pink Floyd again and again. The group, mostly Orr employees, then traveled to Switzerland where they began an extended collaboration in exchange with Leary. The collaboration would result in the lsd fueled album Seven Up, with Leary appearing there on vocals, Ashrod Temple on music, and Kaiser as producer. 
recorded in Bern, Switzerland in 1972, and then released in 1973, 7-Up was named for the LSD-laced 7-Up drinks the musicians were given during the session. It was an oddity representative of the overall period. Kaiser's use of LSD and other indiscriminate psychedelics increased after contact with Leary. It turned from utilitarian use to reliance on. Kaiser and Lethman were soon publishing rabid defenses of Leary's drug guruism. One of the more bizarre ones accused the German music magazine Sounds of collaborating with the CIA to capture Leary. Somewhat ironic, as Leary later neglected to mention the entire episode in his later recountings, and, as is somewhat known, later turned turncoat on the whole culture and became a federal informant. Kaiser, led along by Lettmann, soon announced their intention to produce true music inspired by all this. Truth is not just expressed through words or content that can be described with words, it is so much more. Truth is the serenity in the eyes of someone who has experienced many trips, the peacefulness on the faces of a group of people who quietly live as a family somewhere in the country, the fairy tales from the east, in ours which we remember, the knowledge of the vast cosmos in which we feel secure, or the gentleness in the gestures of two lovers. The duo, and they were now a duo, almost inseparable, came to call themselves the Kosmisch Kurier, or Cosmic Couriers. They operated under Orr's sublabel Kosmisch Kurier, soon renamed to Kosmisch Musik. The music press began referring to the two as the funny or strange couriers. The super psychedelic turn was partially a marketing gimmick at first, as was normal of Kaiser, but the man did, according to close accounts, become increasingly erratic afterwards. The first major blow had come in May 1973, when Peter Meisel resigned from Orr, likely due to Kaiser's declining coherence. Meisel's parting from Orr would cripple the label's talent relations. Orr's few other employees would soon follow him and establish their own major labels in the German music business, all soon to become Orr's main competitors. The label had been built on Kaiser's ideas, but Meisel was ultimately the necessary element of realism to it. To pay off Meisel's own stake in the label, Kaiser and Lettmann had to take a loan from Lettmann's mother. It was foreshadowing. The structure underneath Orr would soon collapse as it became increasingly unmoored. Kaiser's activities came under scrutiny by the talent. Orr had been able to operate with so many signed bands due to Kaiser's Sunshine contracts, as they were called. The name Sunshine, a reference to LSD. Kaiser's Sunshine contracts essentially made signed bands reliant on Orr's equipment for performances. In return, or got a 25% cut from the signed band's creative activities. That included all creative activities, but mainly albums. The contracts were controversial, but likely not intended to be exploitative outright. In Germany, in the 1970s, PA systems and other equipment were prohibitively expensive for most bands to purchase outright. A PA system at the time would cost multiple years of a monthly salary. Kaiser got around this by making bands rely on Orr's in-house equipment. Musicians, though, soon accused Kaiser of manipulation and deviousness. At Orr, due to the proliferation and commonness of drugs, coffee spiked with LSD was so common it was jokingly called Kaiser's Coffee. Klaus Schulze, of Tangerine Dream, said that Kaiser had been dosing musicians' drinks with LSD, possibly to manipulate them. As Schulze said in a later interview, Partially, we've been forced to take drugs to be allowed to take part in those monster sessions. Schultz's remarks here likely refer to the sessions with Leary, but it was possible it was much more common behind the scenes. Despite crumbling foundations, Kaiser's goals with the Orr and Cosmic Music labels were inflating. By 1973, RUK was claiming he expected a 600% increase in business by the end of the year. This never manifested, and, beside Kaiser and Lettmann themselves, it is unlikely anyone ever believed them. Kaiser became more reliant on the questionable business decisions of the Cosmic Couriers or Cosmic Music label. 
To make up the slack, they began releasing Cosmic Jokers albums. The Jokers albums, named things like Tarot and Sci-Fi Party, were salvage jam sessions Kaiser recorded as a grab bag of material from Orr's signed bands. The release of the material was, if not straight out illegal, highly questionable and debated. Supposedly, Kaiser had maybe drugged the musicians and secretly recorded them playing at his apartment, as noted in Schulz's claims, but others, such as Manuel Goching of Ashra Temple, have stated they were perfectly aware and sober Kaiser owned and released the recordings. They were also sober at the time of recording. The albums were controversial, low quality, and basically disowned by all featured. Gottsching, in a rare neutral defense of Kaiser, did say this on the Cosmic Jokers material. Of course I knew about the releases, of course I had contracts before, and of course I received royalties, even in advance. This was all very little money, but that shouldn't be any reason to spread rumors like this. You can say many things about the producer Rofurik Kaiser, but I have no reason to accuse him of acting incorrectly so far. The Cosmic Jokers material was widely derided by the music press as the cosmic ripoffs by those funny couriers. Kaiser and Lettmann sent special editions to radio stations, both in Germany and beyond, that included their own psychedelic commentary on and in between the music. These remixes by Kaiser included outlandish comedy segments and spoken interludes by Lettmann taking on the identity of the celestial Sternenmädchen, or the starry-eyed girl, forgive pronunciation. The music, a menagerie mostly of Tangerine Dream and Ashrod Temple improvisations, was intended to guide the listener through this spiritual universe they envisioned. Essentially, none of these albums were ever played on air, but they remained an odd curiosity. By this point, R.U.K. and the Stan and Madchen were speaking in purely kitsch psychedelic press releases. One claimed that Cosmic composers know no rules. They master all styles. Rock, folk, classical, synthesizer. The duo credited everyone from Albert Einstein to Werner von Braun to Tutankhamen to Yuri Geller to even Star Trek, UFOs, and Planet Hoover as an influence on the cosmic music. These later compilation albums would all feature messages from Gail Hitman's character, the Sternenmädchen, or the Star Maiden, later to become only Sternenmädchen. Slowly, the identity of Sternenmädchen began to consume the entire operation. Her psychedelic stream of consciousness writing began to fill entire albums. Hello, galactic people. I am the Sternenmädchen. I've been blown to earth to bring you joy. Now you have one of the records I produced for you. Close your eyes and dig it. From a cloud with regards, kill Sternenmädchen. By the end of Kaiser's public career, Lettmann had completely abandoned the name Gil Lettmann, and it was only Sternenmädchen. She did not even use any articles with it. It was simply one single unified name. It all read like a deluded effort by a label that was bleeding money and a duo that was losing sanity. How much did LSD play a part in all this? The public believed it was a major factor after former OR employees began to leak rumors about Kaiser's coffee. Long after Kaiser's own decline into obscurity, claims circulated that from the inner Kaiser circle, at least five ended up in a psychiatric ward. These claims were sourceless, of course, but they implied something about the reputation of Kaiser's name and what it was associated with. By 1973, reality had already come knocking when Schulze and Froza fully broke from Kaiser. In separate lawsuits, after Tangerine Dream had left Orr, Schulze and Froza both sued Kaiser. The lawsuits pertain to illegal contracts, breach of contracts, unpaid royalties, and work issues at Orr which pertain to Kaiser's own reliance on drugs. The lawsuits dragged on, with a second one being filed by Froza, until 1974 in Berlin District Court. In court, it became apparent Orr, overall, was a sinking ship and its coffers were totally empty. 
Neither Kaiser or Letman had even embezzled from the company. There simply was no money left. It had all been spent. Kaiser's wild spending to sign a hefty stable of bands had come due. When it was learned Kaiser could not even pay his lawyers, much less the royalties owed, all remaining contracts at Orr were void. On the first lawsuit, the law ruled in favor of Schulze and Froza, but nothing was gained besides freedom from said contracts. That, as it turns out, Kaiser could not have even enforced because he was broke. Even after Froza's second lawsuit for outstanding royalties, there was no repayment to be had four years later. The Federal Court of Justice symbolically ruled in his favor, but it was an empty victory. Due to outstanding debts and legal violations, all assets related to Orr and its sublabels were seized and ceased operation in 1975. A majority of rights returned to the original artists, or licensed out to new managers, but Kaiser's operation was functionally and legally kaput. By 1975, Kaiser was totally bankrupt, and the last six years were a check he could not cash. For many years afterwards, it was a mystery what happened to R.U.K. After Orr, Kaiser and the Sternenmädchen had to leave West Berlin. They soon recamped to their Cologne apartment, but were soon again evicted from there as well. Until 1990, they lived with Sternenmädchen's mother near Cologne. Kaiser's last known public appearance was in the 1980s to demand royalties from the Orr catalog. A catalog which he was informed he no longer had any legal rights to. As soon as he re-emerged though, Kaiser essentially vanished again. This time for what may be forever. Whenever a station reran a show featuring Kaiser, attempts were made to contact him, but they were always unsuccessful. Checks sent to Kaiser were never cashed, and it's impossible to say if they ever even reached him. If there was a Kaiser to reach anymore. In the 1990s, personal items from Kaiser began to surface in flea markets and secondhand stores around Berlin and Cologne. Several books from Kaiser's library were found, which featured dedications from Timothy Leary to Kaiser. Stern and Mahian, formerly Gil Letman, continued, to this very day, to send out her yearly spiritual screeds, which she called a magazine, to a select few persons, but Kaiser never resurfaced in person, nor even in writing. The duo never made public appearances directly, and rarely returned phone calls. It then became an unspoken assumption that Kaiser was dead. At some point, Kaiser had apparently adopted the identity of Maison Crystallis, another groovy cosmic traveler like Sternmachen. After 40 years in seclusion, Kaiser is unlikely to have a return, and he will not return the same man. If there even is an R.U.K. anymore, and not only this Maison Crystallis. All attempts to reach Maison Crystallis through the Sternenmachen are fruitless as well. While the two lived in Cologne, the select few, usually only old friends, could reach them by phone, but usually only got a what was described as an echo-laden, spacey-sounding message from their answering machine. Nobody could leave a message. The answering machine directed to a telex number which had been disconnected. That is the best word to describe Kaiser's fate. Disconnected. Eventually, that active phone number expired too. In 2003, the two were evicted from an apartment after failure to pay rent, and the last of their old associates lost contact with them in 2006. It is assumed, though not outright confirmed, the two were living off social security and the last of their inheritance. In the years following, to this day, the two live off state or church charity and are rumored to be happy. They have no desire for contact with the outside world. As of 2019, Kaiser is still seemed to be alive, according to reports, but living in obscurity alongside the woman now known only as the Sternenmachen. The duo still check the internet for mentions about them once a year by using the free Wi-Fi from a nearby wellness center. But nothing has goaded Kaiser to speak after decades. And apparently nothing will. Thou dance no more with spirit's light, in dark some corners thou wilt bide.
I'd like to give a truly out there thank you to my supporter, the Jail Somini family.